Good morning. Uh, my name is Benjamin Davis. Um, I'm the leader of the strategic program on rural poverty reduction at the Food and, or Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Um, and I just want to thank the, the organizers for the opportunity to, to be here today. It's quite an honor to participate in this conference and to be joined by this uh, distinguished group of policymakers and practitioners, um, champions for, for social protection, for universal social protection. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. Uh, first, we have Ms. Uh, Cecilia Mbaka, who's the head of the National Social Protection Secretariat, the State Department of Social Protection in Kenya. Um, next, we have the Honorable Susan Shabangu, who's the Minister of Social Development uh, from South Africa. Um, we also have, uh, to my left, Mr. Um, Gom Gombo Suren Unubayar, who's the State Secretary of the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection of Mongolia. And finally, we have Ms. Maha Mezruli, the Senior Economist from the Ministry of Social Affairs. Um, so how will this session work? Um, I'll give a, a brief introduction to the session, um, then we'll have a panel format, and so I have some questions for each of the panelists, and then if there's time, we'll open it up for, for broader um, discussion and for questions if, if all of you have comments or, or uh, questions you'd like to make. So I'm from the, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and people all the time ask, you know, why does FAO concern itself with social protection? And um, first and foremost, because it's fundamental to our mission. Uh, without social protection, we can't achieve our global goals of eliminating hunger, uh, reducing rural poverty, and fostering sustainable agriculture. It's impossible. Um, social protection complements everything that we do. So I want to give a little uh, con context to this session um, about making the case for universal social protection. Um, I have four points. They follow along on what we heard in the first session. I'm sure there are more, but basically four points on why we're here advocating for universal social protection. First, uh, it's a matter of rights, of justice, punto, for everyone. Um, as we heard, the right to social security is enshrined in the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Effective access to social protection is essential to fill many of the other rights, including the right to food, the right to education, and the right to health. Uh, many national constitutions include the right to social protection, including two of the countries on the panel, South Africa and Kenya, and many countries have anchored social protection benefits in their, in their national legislation. So first and foremost, it's a, it's a question of rights. Now, I think as we all know, um, Many influential decision makers uh, may need to be persuaded by, by other arguments and other reasons, right? And so the second point I wanna make is the strong economic rational, rationale for social protection. There's very clear, rigorous evidence, most, much of it generated uh, jointly by the governments here today, in particular South Africa and Kenya, along with the World Bank, with UNICEF uh, and FAO, um, pointing to the, the economic uh, importance of, of social protection. First and foremost is, is the question of human capital development, and there's a long history of, of evidence around uh, demonstrating this impact in terms of uh, reducing, relaxing the demand side constraints to education and health, leading to increased productivity now and in the future of children uh, who benefit uh, from social protection. Second, it enhances the economic and productive potential of the poorest. Um, it relaxes liquidity and credit constraints to investment um, in self-employed activities, agriculture in particular. Uh, it's a tool to manage risks, uh, to raise the horizon from immediate survival to longer term uh, potential of economic uh, accumulation. And third, it can stimulate local economic development. And here, social protection can uh, stimulate demand for goods and services, leading to economic multipliers, often in more marginal uh, uh, rural, rural communities. These last two areas, the economic and the local economic uh, development, have been particular focus of, of FAO with partners over the past 10 years in terms of demonstrating that um, impact, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, 
Latin America, and other regions. So what it means for social protection beneficiaries, there are real tangible impacts on livelihoods. And when it's linked with the perspective of productive inclusion, um, explicitly linking uh, social protection with livelihood initiatives, uh, with agricultural policy and programs, it creates synergy, synergies for real um, potential and a real potential for, for impact. The third point is, uh, is there's also a very strong environmental and sustainability rationale for social protection, okay? particularly in the context of climate change. Uh, first is reducing vulnerability and the reliance on negative risk coping strategies in the face of shocks. It helps households smooth consumption, protect their assets, and protect their natural resources. Second, it can facilitate the transition to more sustainable livelihoods. And this is crucial because the poor, particularly the rural poor, are often the guardians of uh, crucial natural, uh, resource, uh, natural resources um, which are being affected by, by climate change. And so it can be an integral part of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. Uh, it's playing a central role uh, in early uh, green climate fund projects. Um, there's even an example from Paraguay where the, the, the project is being is being built on the back of a social protection system. And so it's fundamental to that transition to more sustainable livelihoods. And then finally, social protection systems are, can play an important role in terms of disaster preparedness um, and response. So finally, uh, my fourth point is that social protection is a cross-cutting fundamental part of the, of the SDG agenda. It's a key instrument which cuts across the SDGs. Um, and here I'll make an appeal is that it really needs to be focused uh, explicitly on rural areas, because um, without that, we're not going to reach um, most of the SDG goals. In rural areas is where you find the, the bulk of the poor and the extreme poor. Um, and in terms of not leaving anyone behind, this is where you find the most vulnerable, the poorest, and the hardest um, to reach. And so universal social protection doesn't just happen universally and all at once. Uh, it need, you need to make dedicated, specific efforts to reach, reach the most vulnerable, and we should start with them, perhaps, um, for once. And that, could, that includes indigenous peoples, people in the informal sector in rural areas, forest communities, fisher folk, uh, rural women. Um, and this is really the only way, obviously, to reach SDG 1.3, but also 1.1, 2.1, 10.4, um, et cetera. And so to do this, we need uh, champions. Uh, we have the champions here today for universal social protection on the panel. Um, and so with that, I would just like to, to begin the, the panel discussion. <clears throat> so first, my first question is for the Honorable Minister uh, from South Africa. Um, Minister, what were the reasons for which South Africa decided to significantly extend social protection coverage uh, for the large majority of children, persons with disabilities, and older people, as well as domestic and, and rural workers? And what was the role of evidence? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, the reason for South Africa for adopting uh, or realizing the universal social protection as a human right matter. The reason is that if we go back to 1994, where we adopted a constitution which talks to the issues of human rights, and on the basis of that, it was felt that we cannot be a country which continues to experience poverty, but also which continues with inequalities. And on the basis of that, Various, at various times, we had to come up with uh, mechanisms which intend to address poverty, but also in making sure that we are a country which works towards equality. Hence, uh, we adopted the National Development Plan, which is in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. And part of that, it's in line with that because in 2030, we all know that uh, we've uh, committed to eradication pov poverty through SDGs and as a country through our national development plan, which is also very much in line with the SDGs, which is 2030, where we committed as a country to have poverty in our country by 2030. And that tends to address the issues of uh, education where we've committed to making sure that uh, 
We provide uh, free compulsory basic education from, uh, for our children from grade zero up to grade 12, which will be your, uh, from primary to secondary education, which has been offered free. But we've gone further now to extend the free basic education to tertiary education, where now we have our national NASFAS, which is our National Student Fund, which intends to make sure that kids from poor communities can have access to higher education in our country, as making sure that education becomes free to those who cannot afford. As we know that if you are a country, or you are unable to have educated communities, then it has an impact of not being able to advance your interest or your country's needs, both socially and economically. Hence the issue of targeted education, free education at tertiary and higher education in our country. But I also need to indicate that uh, we've also looked at um, making sure that we have social grants, and our social grants uh, refers to the pensionables, the elderly people. It also covers our disability. It also covers children who, or teenage pregnancies where young kids or teenage girls get pregnant uh, and are unable to take care of their children, and we offer child grant. Linked to the child grant also now, we've also introduced a second chance for the teenage girls in making sure that they are able to go back to school and further their education because we all know if those girls remain at home and are unable to advance their education, it would have meant that their future is doomed. So we have a program which is called Second chance linked to that, I think there has been a big discussion, which is non globally, where we talk about health, the national uh, health insurance. And that system now, I am comfortable to say, as a country now, it's in front of parliament where it's going to be discussed and be taken further for its final implementation. And linked to that, we are a country which has maternity leave. And recently we've passed on the issue of paternity leave for men because it's important for men to play a role when it comes to the family, but also the children, bonding with the children. So it's not only maternity for women, it's also for men. And these are some of the issues which we've introduced as a country. We have expanded public works program, which becomes part of making sure that those who are unemployed, they can find employment. And recently linked to that, we've just passed a minimum wage, um, proclaimed a minimum wage where no one must earn below a 20 rand per hour in our country. We have the UIF, which we're relooking really looking at it together with road accident funds for those who are involved in accidents for them to be able to be sustained within the process. So, we have many issues which intend to have poverty in our country, but also as part of our universal social protection in ensuring that no one goes hungry. Lastly, I also want to say linked to health, we are providing 4.4 million plus people in our country which area risk, which its intention is to extend their lifespan and that has really worked well for South Africa. So these are some of the issues and how we have achieved some of these uh, universal social protection or access to social protection, it's also by engaging the various stakeholders, the various partners, the various partners, it's your private sector, it's your labor, it's your civil society in our country in making sure that we become inclusive as we advance the interest of uh, social protection in our country. I think I would want to stop there for now. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Uh, Minister, can I follow up that question and ask you, how have these policies contributed to economic and social development in South Africa, in particular rebuilding the, the post-apartheid society? Well, I must say, um, I must say this has really improved 
and make sure that everyone becomes part of the integrated South Africa. Because we come from a past where we had a society which was uh, highly depleted, highly discriminatory. And that has contributed also in making sure that it creates opportunities by making sure that through the various policies, we see more young people, elderly people, being part of the economic development in our country. That is why we are talking about the second chance for young children, for young girls, but also we're talking about uh, our education system, which has contributed to ensuring that we open up economic opportunities for many, many people in our country, which has contributed to making sure that uh, your SMMEs too can contribute in growing our economy. We might not be performing well so far because of where we come from, but we are positive that uh, the line we've taken when it comes to universal social protection, it's not just about being a welfare state, but it's also about how do we grow our economy by creating opportunities and various subsidies for business opportunities in South Africa. And that assists us in ensuring that we are inclusive, but we also make sure that even those who are poor are able to access opportunities uh, through various, for instance, housing. We have uh, subsidized housing in South Africa, which makes sure that there's decent living for various communities. And we are also looking at various opportunities where there are also business opportunities and subsidies, which allows various communities or various people who want to enter business to have those opportunities. There are subsidies, for instance, for those who want to start businesses. There are various hubs. And recently now, through the presidency, we are seeing opportunities when it comes to the fourth industrial a revolution by making sure that we have programs partnering with various private sector companies it is part of poverty alleviation but also as part of skills development in our country. We are one country which has also, as the previous speaker indicated, the issue of corporate social investments. We are a beneficiary as a country when it comes to corporate social investments where the majority of uh, the private sector companies are playing a role in job creation, in skilling of our young people, but also in making sure that opportunities and set-asides are there for those who want to participate in contribution towards, contributing towards our economies. These are some of the issues which in the past were never there, but where we are, the whole issue of integration, the whole issue of uh, the various partnerships in skills development, in job opportunities, is there in creating a better South Africa. And where we are, we also intend to, as I spoke about poverty and the intergenerational poverty, which we've seen for many, many years, improving those kind of issues in our country. So expanded public works, it's also a stopgap measure in skilling our people, making them ready for other job opportunities which are, may arise in our country. So these are some of the issues which we are doing coming from the past in making sure that we become an inclusive society. And the last thing which I would also like to indicate is that uh, we also see the issue of uh, universal social protection being the issue of closing the gap between the poor and the rich, but also closing the gap between the sick and the healthy. That's how we see shaping South Africa to be a better country for all of us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next, I'd ask to like uh, I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Sa Secretary. Um, why has Mongolia extended social protection to previously uncovered populations, including making um, uh, benefits and services accessible to rural populations, including our herders. Yeah, thank you, Madrister. Thank you for your question. I am pleased to share our experience at this important event. Uh, half of Mongolia population are herders, and animal husbandry play a big role in the economy of the country. 
Uh, their contribution of animal husbandry to GDP is more than 10%, uh, and about 30% uh, of employed population are herders. Income from animal husbandry is the only source of income. Of nearly 20% of uh, total households, until 99, Mongolia was a socialist country. During the socialist time, the state used to provide all the pension to all herders when they retire. Because at uh, that time, all economic activities were state-owned and therefore herders were actually working for the state and getting wages and incentives. The current package of law on social insurance entered into force from 1995. And according to current law, laws and regulations, Herder can pay voluntary contributions equivalent to 11 percent of their income. Thus, they become eligible for old age benefits, benefits for disability, and breadwinner loss. However, in real life, due to low and unstable income, as well as, as, well as convenience to pay the premiums, the coverage of herders in social insurance system is extremely low. Therefore, old age security for herders is a priority of the government to prevent them from falling into poverty. We need to find solution appropriate mechanism to enable their monthly contribution to the social insurance fund and thus to ensure their old age security. The government of Mongolia is talking some measures to improve and old age security for herders since 2012, the government is implementing an important measure to improve old age income security of people who were not able to work during the transition period. More specifically, the gaps in pension contribution of those who were not working during 1999-2000 were subsidized by the government and 20% of those who benefited from this measure were herders. In addition, we are implementing a new policy to reduce the pension age of herders by five years, considering the health condition of their labor. Furthermore, a new law will become effective from 2020, which will enable herders and self-employed to pay once for their pension contributions to cover the period of 1995 to 2090, when they had to change their employment status or pay it to be employed due to the nature of their occupation or work. On the other hand, our social protection policy for herders aims to protect the livestock sector in the future. As the younger generation is not willing to become herders, thus the number of herders is likely to reduce significantly in the future. This has also negative impact on the land that might become deserted and inhabited, especially remote rural areas currently occupied by nomad herders. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. I think it's a good example of the, um, the importance of, or the challenges of extending social protection benefits to uh, um, more isolated, difficult to reach rural areas and, and benefits which are actually in tune and appropriate for the given livelihood um, uh, of, in this particular case, and the characteristics of, of rural herders. If I can follow up with the next question, and that's what's interesting here is, how is the combination of contributory and non-contributory mechanisms, both social insurance and tax-funded benefits, facilitated this extension of coverage? In Mongolia, 79% of the 
of economically active population, uh, 59 of entities and 6% of health care covered by social insurance. Two citizens who are not eligible for pensions and benefits from the social insurance fund receive pension and benefits from social welfare fund. So the combination uh, of contributory and non-contributory mechanism facility the full coverage of old age security for elderly. Mongolia has a generous system of tax funded by social welfare benefits including the recipient of child money program, the help of Mongolia population are beneficiaries of the social welfare services. We, if we look at a specific group of population, 70% of elderly, 87% of people with disabilities, 87% of children are benefiting from one or more social welfare measures. The current priority of the government is now to shift from welfare to employment by adding some conditional lead, lead to the social welfare program is for working age people. For instance, our good stamp program has now some conditions for working age people to actively search for jobs. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Ilya Mbaka, uh, why has Kenya decided to invest in developing a social protection system and move towards universal coverage? And what was the role of evidence in that process? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as Kenya, we are very happy to be here to share with all of us our journey on uh, social protection, which has been very exciting. And um, the reason why Kenya has decided to invest in social protection is because to start with, we are obligated by various international, uh, regional, and local um, obligations to design and implement social protection programs. Uh, just moving straight to local, our constitution is very clear on issues of social protection. In one of the articles, and that, article, that is Article 43 of our, of our constitution, it obligates the state to support uh, people who cannot be able to support themselves and their families. In addition to that, Article 22 also um, allows citizens to institute uh, court proceedings in case uh, that right is violated. As a country, we also have uh, the vision, our Vision 2030, which aims at providing a high quality of life for all citizens by the year 2030. And the goal of so the social pillar is to build a just and cohesive society with social equity. And with those obligations then, as a country, we have started a number of social protection programs. And before I go to sharing with you the, so, the, the, the various social protection programs, I would like to share with you our high poverty levels by the time we were starting to roll out uh, social protection programs. In 2005, uh, Kenya's poverty levels were as high as 46%. And I will be telling you later where we are now. And uh, since 2003, we, roll out, we rolled out the cash transfer for orphaned and vulnerable children. We have also gradually uh, rolled out uh, the older persons cash transfer program. And in the, current in the current year, I mean last year, sorry, last year, we rolled out the universal cover for older persons. Uh, we are also running a free maternal and uh, child Child health, we've been learning it since uh, 2013 with a lot of uh, uh, impacts on it as, as I'll be sharing with you. We're running uh, school feeding programs in uh, arid and semi-arid part of Kenya. And for those of you who do not know, half of Kenya is made up of arid and semi-arid lands, where the poverty levels in those countries are very poor. And so we have started school feeding programs to encourage our children to go to school and to remain in school to be able to learn. Uh, we are also piloting the universal uh, health cover uh, we are piloting it in, uh, in about five counties, 
and hopefully rolling out in all parts of the country uh, after one year, after we have learned experiences and we can be able to, to, to expand it. We're also running uh, the free primary education, which we started in the year uh, 2002, and bearing a very, um, I, I mean, with a lot of impact as we speak. Um, we're also running social security uh, programs and uh, the health insurance program. And uh, what I would want to say is that we're seeing a lot of impacts on these programs. To start with, when uh, we did our Kenya Integrated Household Budget Survey in uh, 2005, uh, as I said, and uh, we did the last one in 2015, our poverty levels have dropped by 10%. We are now at 36%. And this is being attributed to some of the, um, to some of the social protection programs that we have been running in the last couple of years. I would also want to say that with the CTOVC program, uh, we have seen increased uh, school enrollment, retention, and um, uh, transition rates. This is evidenced by impact evaluations that we have done in the last uh, couple of years. We are seeing improved uh, nutrition and di dietary diversity because of the cash transfer programs that we, we're giving uh, to households with young children. We are seeing a reduction in child labor um, and, and very many other benefits that are coming with these programs. Uh, with our free maternal and child health for children below five years of age, we are seeing uh, more mothers giving birth in hospitals. In fact, in the urban areas, we are enrolling even up to 100% of mothers giving uh, birth in, um, in hospitals, although this will vary in the, the rural areas because of the transport issues and the uh, ignorance, but we can say that this has seen uh, more uh, mothers giving high in hospitals, and so the survival rates um, are actually uh, quite high. Uh, yes, thank you. So in Kenya, in what uh, direction will, will, will the country be going in the near future in terms of continuing to expand the um, as we think about uh, expanding our social protection programs, uh, moving forward, we would want to see a more life cycle approach to one social protection programs. Already we are there. We are seeing programs uh, covering um, expectant mothers. We have programs for children below 18 years of age. We have youth programs. For example, we are running a youth fund that enables uh, people, I mean young people to uh, get very soft loans that they can be able to start businesses with. We are seeing programs uh, for older persons. And so moving forward, we would want to strengthen the life cycle approach to social protection. In addition to that, we're moving towards universality. We have already um, uh, uh, started a universal program uh, for older persons aged 70 years and above. Uh, we are also having a debate on introducing, uh, progressively introducing um, a universal child grant that we shall be discussing in the next three days, those of us who will continue being here. Now, the other thing is that as we move forward, issues of sustainability are very key to us. Because as we extend the programs, then we shall be requiring a lot of resources to be able to support these programs. And so um, we're lobbying the government to continue supporting uh, social protection programs. Last year, we had in, an international conference on sustainable financing for social protection. I know uh, some of you who are here participated in that conference. So it is a debate that we would really want to carry forward. Uh, other than that, um, uh, we have developed an investment plan towards the Vision 2030. It, it details the kind of programs that we would want to see either rolled out or expanded as we move towards the Vision 2030, and the kind of budgets that government will be requiring to be able to run those programs. 
so that um, every time we're not going to Treasury to tell them we need this money we, to do this and the other, we've already developed an investment plan so that the government is well prepared on the kind of resources that we shall be requiring moving forward. In addition to that, as we think about issues of uh, sustainable financing, uh, we have uh, come up with a task force that is that is discussing how uh, the government will raise, re continue raising resources to support the cash transfer programs. And as a country, we would do other than, um, um, other than depending on the exchequer, we are trying to, um, to see how we can come up with very innovative ways of raising money for the cash transfer programs. And we're looking at how um, um, citizens can be able to contribute small amounts to save for their retirement in a very innovative way. I don't want to, uh, I think I want to go into a lot of details on that because it is still under discussion. It has not been firmed up. But moving forward, we would want to see a situation where citizens uh, contribute some small monies, uh, which is topped up by the government to be able to, um, to save for their retirement. Um, uh, in addition to that, we would want to see the government increase uh, its levels of GDP to one social protection. Currently, it is about 1.5%, with cash transfers taking about 0% of the GDP. As we discuss the issues of sustainability, we would want to see the government continue to increase uh, the GDP, uh, I mean, to increase the levels of the GDP that is going towards, towards the investment of social protection. And in our investment plan, we've, we're looking at the government increasing this to about um, 2 to 3 percent of the GDP going towards, um, towards social protection. Yeah. Thank you. Great. No, thank you. Uh, my next question is for uh, Ms. Maha Mezri. Um, in Tunisia uh, has been very committed to, to extending social protection um, benefits and, uh, and has achieved impressive results. What makes investments in social protection so important for Tunisia's economic and social development? Merci, Monsieur le, le Président. Je voudrais tout d'abord euh, vous faire part des salutations de Monsieur le ministre des Affaires sociales, M. Mohamed Trabelsi, qui, qui aurait dû être euh, ici parmi vous euh, lors de cette conférence, mais qui, pour des raisons euh, euh, d'engagement de, 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 professionnel, euh, n'a pas pu venir. Donc, euh, je, je vous remercie pour votre question. Euh, mais euh, avant de... Je vais vous donner une, un, aper, un aperçu sur euh, l'expérience tunisienne en matière d'universalisation de, de la protection euh, euh, sociale. Euh, donc, la, la, la Tunisie, dans, pour la Tunisie, le système de protection sociale repose sur un ensemble de programmes d'assistance sociale et, des, et, des, et un dispositif euh, d'assurance sociale et a été abattu sur une approche progressive. Donc, ainsi, la sécurité sociale en Tunisie remonte euh, aux années euh, 1898, année de la création de la première caisse de prévoyance pour les fonctionnaires tunisiens qui étaient chargés de la gestion du premier régime de retraite en Tunisie. Le, ensuite, en 1921, il y a eu la création du régime de réparation des préjudices résultant des accidents de travail. Le secteur de sécurité sociale a connu ainsi euh, sa véritable lancée au cours des années euh, 60, donc après l'indépendance, et il y a eu une extension progressive et continue de la couverture euh, à toutes les catégories professionnelles. C'est ainsi qu'en 1959, il y a eu un régime de retraite pour le secteur public. En 1960, le régime général des salariés pour le secteur non agricole. Euh, les étudiants en 1965, le régime des pêcheurs en 1977, ainsi de suite. Euh, actuellement, la sécurité sociale couvre tous les secteurs d'activité et euh, le taux de, euh, de couverture réel est de 85%. Euh, il est à noter que la couverture ne s'est pas limitée aux travailleurs euh, résidents en, Tunis en Tunisie. Elle s'est étendue également aux travailleurs résidents à l'étranger par le biais des conventions bilatérales de sécurité sociale et la mise en place d'un régime de couverture facultatif pour les Tunisiens travaillant dans les pays avec lesquels la Tunisie n'a pas de convention bilatérale de sécurité sociale. Au niveau des programmes de l'assistance sociale, nous avons un programme phare qui est le programme national d'aide aux familles nécessiteuses qui a été créé en 1986 et qui consiste à accorder des, des aides 
des transferts monétaires aux familles qui ont des revenus pauvres. Et un autre programme institué en 1998 a consisté à mettre en place un système d'assurance médicale gratuite et à tarif réduit. Et ces deux programmes sont financés par le budget de l'État. Donc, s'il est vrai que le système de protection sociale tunisien a joué depuis sa création un rôle indiscutable en matière de lutte contre la pauvreté et d'inclusion sociale, il a quand même montré ses limites, notamment au niveau de l'interaction et la complémentarité entre les différentes actions publiques en matière de protection sociale, due à une fragmentation entre les différents programmes et un manque de cohérence. Et donc, c'est dans ce cadre qu'aujourd'hui, qu tout un système de réforme de son système de protection sociale a été engagé par, par, par le, le pays. Et il est rappelé que l'adoption de la Constitution de 2014, dans son article 38, garantit le droit à la couverture sanitaire et sociale pour tous. Donc, ça a été une occasion pour entamer une réforme globale qui permettra d'améliorer la pertinence, l'efficacité et l'efficience du système de protection pour un développement global et inclusif. Donc... Euh, les, les principaux objectifs de, de cette réforme, c'est de, 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 de la réforme des régimes de, de, de sécurité sociale, le maintien des équilibres financiers des régimes, la réforme de la gouvernance des caisses de sécurité sociale, la réforme de l'assistance sociale et la garantie par l'État aux catégories vulnérables droit d'accès aux soins d'un seuil minimum de revenus avec un meilleur ciblage des interventions en leur faveur conformément à des, aux, aux, à des normes objectives. Donc, euh, tout, un, euh, tout un chantier a été euh, mis en œuvre en, en matière de, de, de réforme. Et l'objectif ultime était, étant de mettre en place un socle national de protection sociale conformément à la recommandation 202 de, 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 adoptée par l'Organisation internationale du travail sur les socles nationaux de protection sociale en 2012. Donc, parmi les réformes que nous avons engagées réellement dans le sens de l'universalisation de, de, de la protection sociale, c'est le régime de, 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 de la sécurité sociale et particulièrement le régime de retraite. Donc, euh, euh, il, est, il faut rappeler que le, le système tunisien, euh, c'est un, un système lié à l'activité la, la, professionnelle et euh, donc c est, c est, il fonctionne selon le système de répartition et donc son financement est basé sur des cotisations des salariés et des employeurs. Donc, la réforme de la sécurité sociale euh, constitue une priorité nationale dans le plan de développement et surtout en, en raison des, des difficultés euh, grandissantes en matière de financement de, des caisses de sécurité sociale euh, dues à des facteurs tels que les mutations euh, démographiques, le facteur économique et ainsi que les éléments paramétriques des régimes de retraite. Euh, une autre réforme qui a été engagée et, et, et qui est une, aussi, tout aussi importante, c'est la, la réforme des programmes d'assistance sociale. Euh, L'objectif de, ce, de, ce, de cette réforme est d'améliorer le, le ciblage et l'efficacité des programmes d'aide sociale qui sont destinés aux populations pauvres et à revenus euh, limités. Euh, enfin, euh, nous, nous, nous ouvrons aussi pour la mise en place d'une stratégie nationale de, de, de lutte contre la pauvreté et d'insertion sociale. Et, et là, euh, l'approche, c'est une approche multi, euh, multidimensionnelle. Donc, on veut euh, attaquer la pauvreté, non pas de, 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 du point de vue monétaire uniquement, mais euh, comment améliorer l'accès des pauvres aux services de première nécessité euh, et comment leur favoriser la, la facilité de cet accès. Euh, concernant le, le socle national de protection sociale, donc c'est un projet très, sur lequel nous, nous, nous il y a un engagement politique fort, donc même par, par, par un, un consensus tripartite à, 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 autour de cette question. Donc nous considérons que c'est un moyen irréversible de lutter contre l'extrême pauvreté. Euh, donc les, les, les garanties sur lesquelles nous travaillons, c'est l'accès aux soins universels. Donc, euh, on a relevé que malgré les efforts entrepris par l'État pour assurer la, la couverture universelle, nous avons quand même à peu près 8,2 de la population qui ne, ne, ne bénéficie d'aucune couverture sanitaire. Donc, d'où ce travail d'envergure de, 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 pour que cette couverture une soit universelle réponde, et répondant à des critères d'accessibilité de, de qualité. On travaille également sur la garantie d'un revenu minimum pour ceux qui sont, en sont dépourvus. Et la, la garantie d'un revenu pour les personnes âgées et les handicapés, également, euh, demain, demain et après-demain, on aura l'occasion d'en discuter pour mettre en place un revenu euh, pour, euh, pour les enfants. 
Donc euh, là, là, on est en dans, dans, la, dans la phase de, de réflexion. Il y a des études de faisabilité pour les différentes garanties du socle. Nous travaillons avec le BIT et, et l'UNICEF pour ce qui est la garantie enfance. Et euh, comme a dit ma collègue aussi, nous travaillons sur la, 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 la faisabilité financière euh, parce que la question de financement est très importante et comment euh, garantir cette, la pérennité, la pérennité euh, des, des, du financement de cette protection sociale. Nous travaillons sur l'enfance, mais, mais, mais cette, euh, la, la, la faisabilité financière pour le programme de l'enfance pourra nous servir euh, également pour les autres garanties euh, du, du socle. Et je vous remercie. If I can just follow up on, can you, can you explain a bit more in terms of how the, the social protection system in Tunisia contributes to decent work and, in, and inclusive growth? Uh, uh, oui, tout à fait. Uh, nous, nous, la, la méthode que nous, sur laquelle nous procédons actuellement, c'est de voir uh, qui, uh, qui n'est pas inclus dans les systèmes actuels uh, de, de protection sociale parce que nous, voulons, nous travaillons sur l'inclusivité euh, et euh, cette démarche, c'est de voir un peu les, 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 les gens qui, qui ont du mal à, atteindre, à accéder à cette protection sociale, euh, par, dont notamment par exemple, les, 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 le secteur informel, euh, les, les femmes rurales, donc, euh, qui, qui, sont, qui, qui travaillent, mais qui, qui a, le système sur le plan légal existe, mais, mais vu que le, dans le secteur rural, le, le, les revenus ne sont pas permanents et sont faibles, donc il y a une difficulté à, à, à intégrer le régime de sécurité sociale. Donc nous, tra nous travaillons pour que, euh, mettre en place un, un, un système de protection sociale qui soit, euh, disons, attractif et qui, qui tienne en considération la, les capacités contributives de, de, des, femmes, de, des femmes rurales. Donc, euh, nous travaillons sur cette question. Également, euh, dans la loi de finances de 2019, nous avons euh, euh, proposé de, de mettre un, un taux de cotisation euh, qui, 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 qui n'est pas très élevé, de 6,7%, pour ainsi inciter le secteur informel à accéder euh, donc, euh, à la protection sociale et, de, et partant de là à avoir cette, ce, un travail, donc être couvert, donc un travail décent, ce qui va contribuer au développement économique du pays, bien sûr. Et comme je vous l'ai dit, par rapport à, à la à la, à, aux populations pauvres, euh, la nouvelle démarche, c'est de voir un peu comment euh, ces familles ne restent pas tout le temps dans la pauvreté. Il faut que, euh, investir pour qu'ils sortent de cette pauvreté. Donc, c'est pour ça que nous, nous travaillons sur la, le programme de lutte contre la pauvreté et l'inclusion sociale. Donc, la, la, la composante inclusion est très importante, voire dans ces familles. On, on travaille sur un, 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 un modèle de vie pour chaque, chaque ménage pour voir un peu comment le faire sortir de la pauvreté, soit en en jouant sur, euh, sur la, 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 la protection sociale des enfants, soit sur euh, les personnes qui sont capables de travailler euh, pour enfin qu'ils sortent un peu de cette, de, du cercle vicieux de la pauvreté et euh, qu'ils aient une protection sociale, euh, disons, euh, adéquate et décente. Globalement, c'est ça. Thank you very much. Um, we still have a few minutes, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, from the audience, and so I'll open it up. Right there. Okay, Please. thank you very much. My name is Marvi Maiman, and I'm the CEO of Lifelong Learners Consultancy. I'm the former chairperson of Benazir Income Support Program, uh, Minister for Social Safety um, earlier. Uh, my question really is about the main issue that we're discussing throughout this morning, which is 60% of, uh, of the uh, informal economy, which doesn't have access to social protection. Now, uh, the way I, as chairperson and former minister, and we in Pakistan dealt with it, I think was the National Socioeconomic Registry. When you register uh, la plupart des gens, the, uh, most of your population, then you're better able to capture that informal economy and have data on it. We were speaking about the lack of data. So I think investments need to be made by governments in that. I've seen that we in Pakistan made that investment and it paid off exceptionally well. My second point, because I'm a practitioner, I'm a politician, and I'm speaking out of pure experience, is the following, and I'm sure the panel which is sitting there is going to perhaps agree or disagree. There is a problem. Uh, we all have constitutions. We all have articles within constitutions 
uh, which guarantee us this. We all have international obligations, but we also have elections, and we also have change of governments. So we normally have a two-step forward, one-step backward approach, or vice versa, or whatever. We need to deal with that, and we need to ensure that when changes of government happen, those international obligations are super supreme and they, they make sure that there's no backwards happening for the sake of change of governments. Uh, those are comments. I'd, I'd like some, some, some response on that, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. Who would like to respond to that? So the importance of social registries and essentially the issue of political economy of social protection in maintaining over changes in government. Who would like to take that on? Minister? Thank you very much. Uh, just touching on the issue of uh, data. As South Africa, we come from that past where we, did, we were not able to collect or collate and have proper data. But I am proud to say today, we work on the basis of data in various areas. If we talk, for instance, about uh, our social grants, the access to social grant, we have about 17.4 million people. So that's what helps us to plan. Because without a proper data on any issue, you will not be able to plan. So our data system might have challenges, but we are moving in the right direction. Uh, we also have Stats South Africa which tends to be our institution which collects data on a regular basis, which it informs what we are doing as a country. So that help us in being able to plan properly. Um, when you look at, uh, when we talk about access to schooling, for instance, I'll make an example. Last year we had about uh, 300,000 young people who had access to grade 12. So that data helps us to plan, but also being able to say how many have passed, how many are going to university or tertiary education, and how many will go to your technical colleges. When I talk about the issue of um, second chance, it also helps us to say how many young people have dropped out from school, especially the girl child and how many must go back to school to advance their education for them to prepare them for the future. So I think the issue of data is very, very critical, including access to jobs, access to the economy. It, we are able to say, for instance, as a country, we have a population, or we are a population of 43% being young people. That's a reflection that data helps us in our planning as we plan for the economy and plan to move forward. Uh, the issue of the Constitution, I must say, it becomes a critical document uh, for any country because it's a document which you don't wake up every morning and change it. It defines your country. Therefore, for, maybe in other countries it's different, but for us it's very, very important because our fundamentals, our policies, and everything we do is enshrined in the Constitution. It becomes the base document for moving forward. The last point of, on elections and changes, maybe because we're a new democracy, uh, we still have to confront the situation of changes in government by various political parties. For the past 25 years, we had an administration led by the ANC government. So we have not experienced changes on the basis of change of administration, um, like we can see now in America. As you change administration, then major changes happen. So we still find ourselves in a space whereby there tend to be consistency in our policies as we move forward. So we have not been affected by change of, I don't want to change, say change of governance change of administration, because change of government is different. But change of administration tends to contribute, but we are still fortunate. We have not gone through change of administration because the same party still rules even today. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to say something about this, Richard? Uh, 
Juste je, pour, la, pour la question de, des bases de données, c'est vrai, c'est très important. Euh, nous, nous, en Tunisie, on est en train de mettre en place une banque de données sur les familles pauvres et revenus limités et qui vont concerner à peu près 30% de la population. Et, et on, on sait que dedans, il y a probablement des personnes qui, qui, qui ont des capacités contributives et qui sont dans, dans l'informel. Et, et c'est là qu'on va travailler pour un peu les faire basculer du, du, système, euh, informel, euh, du système non contributif vers le système contributif. Euh, une, une autre, euh, une autre euh, activité sur laquelle nous travaillons, c'est la mise en place d'un identifiant social unique. Cet identifiant va permettre de faire des, des recoupements entre les différentes bases de données du ministère des Affaires sociales, c'est-à-dire entre les, les fichiers des, des caisses de sécurité sociale et, le, et la base de données des familles, du système assistantiel, et pour voir un peu s'il n'y a pas des doubles double emplois pour des recoupements nécessaires. Donc là, je, suis, je, je partage l'importance des bases de données. Ils vont aider à, à la prise de décision et à mettre les, les programmes les, les, les mieux, mieux adaptés. Merci. Thank you. Ms. Mbaka. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I think I would want to confirm that uh, social protection programs are very political program, are, are very political. And ch chances of having um, successive governments uh, overturning things are actually very high. And the only way forward then is to ensure that when we initiate social protection programs, then they are entrenched in various policies and in various laws. Um, as a country, uh, we have developed what we call the single registry, um, which, bring, which is a central repository of data on all programs on, uh, on social protection. Currently, is hosting data on the cash transfer programs. And moving forward, we would want to see other pillars included, and that is the, the, the social security and social health insurance. At the same time, we have just entered into a contract with the World Bank uh, where we are going to create a social registry within the single registry, which will map all the poor persons, uh, their characteristics, so that anybody wishing to start um, uh, social protection programs for the poor, they are easily identified within the social registry. You don't have to go looking for them, but they are already known. And that will make it very easy for um, various organizations uh, wanting to start uh, social protection programs. Great, thank you. I have two, well, I had two, yeah, two questions. They had the advantage of being up here front that cut my eye already, no? Um, so I have two questions and then we'll get a response. Yes, ma'am, please, first. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je voudrais juste apporter ma contribution, contribution du Sénégal, euh, puisque, comme viennent de le dire les ministres, pour permettre de, 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 de maintenir les acquis que les autres gouvernements ont pu mettre en place, effectivement, il faudra institutionnaliser certaines bases de données. Comme elles viennent de le dire, nous avons aussi mis en place le registre national unique, qui est un registre qui intègre euh, les ménages pauvres, les ménages vulnérables. Et chez nous, au Sénégal, nous sommes à un nombre de 548 000 ménages qui sont dans cette base de données. Et c'est l'Agence euh, démographique et de la statistique qui a permis la mise en place de ces bases de données. Et l'institutionnalisation permet aujourd'hui de pouvoir garder les acquis pour qu'un autre gouvernement qui viendra aussi ne pourra pas changer les acquis qui sont déjà euh, pu être réalisés. Donc, c'est vous dire que la protection sociale, pour qu'on puisse aller toujours de l'avant, effectivement, il faudra sécuriser, sécuriser pour que les autres qui viennent ne puissent pas changer les programmes qui étaient déjà établis par le régime précédent. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman behind. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Bart. I work for uh, World Solidarity. It's a civil society organization linked to the labor movement in Belgium and a member of the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors. Um, thank you for uh, the different interventions and some of the concrete examples of your governments um, to roll out universal social protection uh, programs. 
Now, my question was more specifically for Ms. Mbaka. Um, I was really delighted to hear how Kenya has really tried to uh, move forward with rolling out universal social protection. Um, you gave a, a various, I mean, various examples of different programs, some contributory, sometimes non-contributory. My first question was, have you also as a government managed to bring them together in an overarching national social protection strategy to avoid fragmentation of different programs? But is there indeed an overarching um, strategy on social protection? Secondly, towards the end, you said moving forward, we want to see citizens now also contributing, for example, towards their pensions. The government would then top up uh, these different amounts. Now, such a move, I think, would really require broad-based um, support in, uh, in Kenyan society to allow for a maximum number of people to participate in such a contributory um, scheme. Now, to generate that broad-based support, are you launching a public debate? Are you working with social partners and perhaps also other civil society organizations that often have experiences in developing and managing such uh, contributory um, schemes? Voilà. Thank you. That question is for you. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> you want to um, uh, what I would want to say as far as the overarching strategy, strategy is concerned, uh, per se we do not have an overarching strategy. However, we have a national steering committee that is made up of government, civil society, and other development partners uh, that is able to chat in a very strategic way on the direction we should be making as a country on, the social, on social protection programs. Uh, but we have plans to come up with a social protection strategy that can guide us very well on how we want to move. Uh, on citizens' contribution, as I say, these are just very initial discussions. And um, uh, what we would want to do is to, to use technology to see how citizens can be able to contribute and have a system that is very easy for them to be able to contribute. But as I said, we've not reached there, but those are our thoughts. Yeah. Great, thank you. I think we have time for just one more comment. There is a woman of the yes, thank you. Thank you, this is Usha from UNICEF Nepal. Um, couple of questions, one very quick one is, uh, we're talking about citizens' rights to social protection in various countries which are represented in the panel, and thanks for sharing that, but is there a vision inside the country for extending that to non-citizens, especially for migrants, for refugees? And I think all the countries which are there, except for Mongolia, would have those kind of challenges in some measure. The second question is about the quality of social protection, and that goes back to the point that Ms. Maha raised. You talked about attractive social protection. I really like that phrase, and which also is linked to, um, uh, ultimately, to the graduation element of social protection that we haven't talked about. Uh, how are the countries ensuring that the social protection actually becomes effective, and how is financial sustainability address, uh, being addressed within that? Great, thank you. Would anyone like to briefly, quickly respond to those questions? Yes? Uh, merci pour votre, uh, votre question. Uh, uh, bon, la question des, des, des réfugiés et des... Uh, bon, uh, la protection sociale pour le moment, elle, elle est accordée uh, uniquement aux aux, gens, aux, 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 aux Tunisiens, donc aux citoyens tunisiens, mais par contre, pour ceux qui ont la, la, la résidence, ils peuvent bénéficier des programmes d'assistance sociale. Euh, donc, le, le, la, on est en train de, 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 de réfléchir à cette question sur un, un, un texte pour, pour les, la question des réfugiés et des, des, qui, qui, sont, qui quand même existent en Tunisie, mais on n'a on pas encore... Un projet de loi a été élaboré, mais il n'a pas encore été validé et, et adopté. Par rapport à la qualité des, des, des prestations, quand on, quand on parle de l'universalité, il y a l'universalité horizontale, mais aussi l'universalité, il faut qu'il y ait un, un, un palier, un, un minimum de... de, 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 de de prestations qui sont servies à toutes les personnes. 
par, par exemple, pour la question de la, de la, la santé, et on est en train de réfléchir pour un panier de, de soins universels qui soit euh, le minimum que tout le monde puisse, euh, puisse euh, avoir, euh, auquel ils peuvent avoir euh, accédé. Donc, euh, c'est dans ce sens qu'on parle de la qualité de la, de la prestation parce qu'il ne suffit, suffit pas de, 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 de donner le, 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 la couverture si, le, si y a, y a le, le, le niveau de prestation est parfois très bas et surtout pour la question de la santé de donner des prestations qui sont très, très faibles donc euh, la, la question de l'universalité n'aurait pas de sens dans un premier temps d'accord mais il faut que ça, ça, ce, ce niveau augmente petit à petit et pour, pour monter on travaille pour qu'on atteigne le, 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 le deuxième niveau du socle de protection sociale, celle du système contributif. Donc on travaille dans les deux sens, dans le horizontal et, et euh, trans, euh, vertical. Merci. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we should bring this to a close since the time's up. Just to make two, two quick points. The first is I think we've had four examples of very strong commitments to universal social protection. These four countries truly are uh, champions in that sense. And we've seen the constant efforts in all four countries um, to expand, to, re to realize universal social protection uh, progressively, and particularly to the challenges of reaching into to rural areas um, in all four countries, and how to, how to make sure this continues and, uh, and institutionally, the infrastructure um, as well. The second point I want to bring up uh, which was just touched on briefly, and that's really about the, the, the considerable effort that was put in, at least by the, the two countries that I have experienced with South Africa and Kenya, in terms of developing the evidence and showing the impact of social protection, um, which is really the merit of these two particular, of, of these two governments. And just to say that social protection in Sub-Saharan Africa is probably the most studied, documented, government program on earth, and there's, there's no doubts. It, the, the impact is clear, it's broad, it goes over another of areas, and, and I think it's, uh, I just want to recognize this commitment from the governments of the region to, to document that case. And so really, it's a, it's a political issue, it's no longer an issue of showing impact. So with that, thank you very much to all four panelists, appreciate very much, and uh, take a break, thanks.